ask you as well. So one of the so we've been going through old vi videotapes of old Bridges Center things. I see. Um, and there's this great video of this dinner that happened that was hosted at, at uh, Gerberding's house. Oh. Um, and I know from the video that you were there. Yeah. And uh, I was in a suit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could share any memories of that dinner. What was that dinner? Well, it really, I, 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 a dinner is not, if we're thinking of the same thing, okay. uh, it really, it was more like a banquet or, mm -hmm. or uh, but it was, I remember it being largely outside. Yeah. It was summertime, and it was at the mansion, the president's, mansion or whatever you call it. It was a very nice event. Um, but what I remember, and, and both David and I gave a speech, which I'm sure was not that great. Um, I remember being in a suit, but the, the best memory I have was of Nikki Bridges, who gave, who was a gifted, gifted writer and uh, a gifted speaker. And she talked about how Harry wasn't really good on feminism and stuff, but he, he was really good on class <laughs> and race. She said, gender, not so good. <laughs> but she gave a very stirring speech. And there were, it was really great to see all these working people and of course there were a lot of people there who were kind of more stereotypical longshoremen I mean big guys you know and here they all are you know at the president's house so it was quite it was quite a quite an event quite and I'm sure the president was impressed too you know yeah I I, w I haven't watched the whole thing, but I watched through Herberding's speech, and I was surprised by things he was saying that I would never imagine yeah. the past UW presidents or the current UW presidents to say. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, there, you may want to ask about this other event, too, There, the event where I guess it was at the inauguration of the chair, but Gene Gundlach had written him a letter about the purging of her brother and several other professors at the beginning of the Cold War, demanding an apology. And Gerberding got up and gave an apology. The, the only sad thing was is this was never picked up in the press or in the university print media but he gave a very forthright apology said that this was a you know this was a policy that was fundamentally wrong and that he apologized for it and so Gene was responsible for that for that happening, and that must have been about a year later at, from this banquet that you've mentioned. Um, could that have been at the Bridges bus dedication? There was, were you, were you at the dedication of the, the Bridges bus in the library? No, that, it wasn't at that. I don't think it was, Andrew, because I think it was upstairs in that room in the Allen Library, the Peterson room, that's where it was. So if that, if that was at the bus thing, then I guess maybe, that, maybe it was, because it was in the library. Do you have any memories of the, the Bridges bus uh, dedication? Not really. Okay. I don't. That's something else we have video of, and I haven't watched it yet. I see. I might not have been here for that, unless it was the same event. Right. I think it was in 94, actually, so it may have been later. I would have been chair. Okay. I think. The, the date on the tapes is 94, so I guess we'll find out. I'll take a look at it. 
Let's see. So the, the, the well, see, I don't even know wh what my tenure was. Was it 94 to 96? That's it might have been, but it might have been after the bus thing. Mm -hmm. It might, I might have taken out, started in August. It was in July of 94, was the, the bus. At any rate, it, it was a big event. Th this thing where, where Gerberding made the apology, it was, uh, that was well attended. I mean, there were several, I would say, a couple hundred people in that room. Um, so uh, now I want to go over each chair, and I want you to say a little something about each chair, um, what you think, with their own, with their own interests that they, and strengths that they brought to the center, um, what you think their legacy is, what are some things maybe that they did as chair that you really liked. Uh -huh. um, and we can start with, um, Margaret was the chair after you followed Right. You. Can you talk a little bit about uh, yeah. Margaret? Well, uh, Margaret was a tough cookie uh, on the steering committee. And I, I remember, you know, I I had a couple of ideas. She wouldn't give me, the, she wouldn't buy them. She uh, shot them down, you know. Uh, one one that I remember was um, we were concerned about the fact that the steering committee had no representation from other parts of the university and there were certain departments in addition to history and political science that I felt and others felt were key and it was important to bring them in, sociology in particular. And so I suggested that we expand the, the uh, participation on the steering committee. Margaret was opposed to this and in part, it was because she felt that there were certain kind of, kind of quasi-legal dimensions to this. Since the chair was housed in the two departments, to bring an outsider in to make decisions about those two departments would raise the hackles of the, not so much the people associated with the chair, but, but the other the members of the two departments. So anyway, that got shot down. The other thing about Margaret was we had competed together. The other hat that I w wore at the university was Latin American Studies, and I was also head of the Latin American Studies program. And there was a competition in the university for a grant from the that w the provost made available that would give a program fifty thousand dollars for activities, and I submitted a proposal for Latin American studies, and Margaret submitted something from I don't know some program she was involved in. These had to be interdisciplinary programs, and I won, and Margaret was incensed. She <laughs> because she's not used to losing. So anyway, she's a tough cookie, and uh, and so when she came in as chair, she came in with a head of steam, and she had a lot of a, a real vision. And among I think her great strengths was she took a course that I had taught for the first time with a woman in sociology, which was Introduction to Labor Studies, and she turned that course into a. Uh, uh, a, a very successful course that is still on the books and which is a core course for the whole program. I think if you had one thing that she did um, and her legacy, it would be making a success out of that course. Many other things. She had an interest in the arts, uh, which I did too, actually. and. Um, and she was able to do several things that brought the visual arts uh, in into labor labor studies, labor activities. So I think that that's another major contribution that she made. So um, following Margaret's, uh, she had two terms. She had two terms. So far, following Margaret, uh, there was. Mike Honey. 
right. he brought his own um, interests and strengths to the, right. to the chair. Would you say a little bit about Mike? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of Mike's uh, biggest supporters, I think. Um, I served, when he was an assistant professor, I served on his tenure committee. And I read his first book. Uh, and I was blown away. This is the uh, black civil rights, what, what is it, Southern, S S Southern something and black civil rights or something, but it's, it's, uh, it's the study of, that led to King's assassination. In other words, his support for sanitation workers in Memphis and the idea that well, the, his, his first book is a much broader study, and it shows that, um, that, that civil rights, the civil rights movement really grew out of the black labor movement. This is a fundamental revision in the way people understand the civil rights movement, so that it was no accident that Martin Luther King got killed by supporting a sanitation worker strike in Memphis. I mean, this was the culmination of a whole career or a whole movement of black trade unionists and civil rights. Uh, it's a beautifully written book. If, you ha if someone didn't know anything about U.S. labor and they picked up this book, they could get a really good idea in, a, uh, in two covers about the nature of the U.S. labor movement. So I'm a real supporter of Mike, and of course he he's continued to produce in this field a whole s series of studies now, uh, building on that first book. So uh, I I think Mike's great strength and what he brought to the center was this commitment to s civil rights and to uh, uh, yeah, black, race and labor studies um, in both his teaching and, and his scholarship. And he's a good example of a real, a real scholar uh, who's held the, the chair. Would you say a little bit about uh, Dan Jacoby? Oh, yeah. You brought to the well, you know, it's funny, you know, I hadn't thought about this, but the first course that I taught, uh, even before the Bridges chair was created, uh, that brought David Brody to teach U.S. labor history in a summer program, Dan Jacoby, who was on the faculty in Bothell, he decided he would enroll in that course. And so he came and that's how I met Dan Jacoby. He came into that class. So uh, he's, he and I have had a relationship from that moment on. Um, I think Dan, Dan's contribution, in addition to broadening the bridge's presence from, of course, Mike Honey, you know, brought in Tacoma, the Tacoma campus, and Dan Jacoby brought in the, a link to the Bothell campus, both of which are expanding and are important for the center, the Harry Bridges Center. Um, his, 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 I think his uh, intellectual interest has been with temporary workers and contingent labor force and uh, worldwide, this is a huge issue and a huge problem. Uh, it's a problem that is really close to home as a faculty member since the number of tenured faculty at, at the University of Washington and other universities in the United States is declining precipitously. And um, these poor contingent workers who are a lot like longshoremen before there was an ILWU, I mean, who basically show up in the morning as a shape up, um, need, need unions. And uh, so Dan 
has studied this problem, run conferences on it, is committed to dealing with it, and and brings this expertise into discussions that we have among UW faculty as we try to deal with our contingent labor force and try to form a union ourselves. So that's Dan. I would say that's one of the main things that he's brought. So he's done a good job of of um, using the center as a way to talk about labor on campus. That yeah, but he uh, but of course he was also very interested in in tech workers, especially Microsoft. Um, but yeah, I mean he and he's he's been. Uh, a real contributor to the discussions as we've tried to move toward a a, a stronger uh, collective presence uh, at the University of Washington. And do you know what his role was in securing funding from the state for the the, Washington, the state labor research grant? I really don't know the answer to that. I know he was involved in it, Andrew, but I don't remember. I don't know. Yeah. I remember when I first started, um, that was evident um, almost immediately was that Dan's legacy was this research um, component of the center. Uh -huh. That grant was something that I remember that um, came about during his Great. term. Well, I know he was involved in it, but I do. Um, so the last um, person I want to ask about, the current chair, uh, Jim Gregory. Yeah. Um, what has been your relationship with him, and what do you think he's brought to the Great. center? Great. Well, as I said at the beginning, you know, I came back to the University of Washington in 1989. At that time, there was nobody teaching labor history in our department except for me. But I was a Latin Americanist, and of course this was a huge hole uh, that we had no nobody specializing in U.S. labor. Uh, and it turned out, as these things are always a little strange at the university, but the history department was seeking to recruit someone for a position they had, not defined as labor, but it was a position in U.S. history, and it turned out that Jim Gregory's wife, Susan Glenn, was a leading candidate that the history department wanted to hire. In fact, she had written a first book on garment workers herself, so in a way she was a labor historian. But she had moved on to do other kinds of research. Uh, at any rate, she was teaching at the University of Texas, but her husband, Jim Gregory, was teaching labor history at the University of California, Berkeley. And the two of them wanted to live together. So they, they, history wanted to hire her, but she wanted she said she'd be willing to come, but she wanted a job for her husband, too. Well, that's always very difficult, right? But it turned out there was another position opening up a year hence in the history department that could be used for Gregory's position. And he had very strong credentials in his own right. And, of course, Berkeley is a major is the best public university in the country. So um, at that point, I went to David Olson, and I, who was the current chair, and I said, David, here's a chance to get two new labor historians for the Bridges Center, but we need to come up with bridge money for this one year that that would be needed for Gregory's salary. And David supported this from the beginning. We talked the history department into it, convinced the dean, and they made the offer to the two of them, and both of them accepted. Well, that was the best thing we could have done for the, in the long haul for the Bridges Center, I think, because um, Jim Gregory is a gifted teacher, 
Uh, he's an activist on campus. He's been very, uh, very involved in efforts to form a union. He's been president of our professional organization, which acts sort of like a union, the American Association of University Professors, AAUP. He's now the head of the, Sen the university senate, in which he is the major voice of the faculty in its dealings with the administration and the board of trustees. Uh, let alone, he's served two terms as Bridges chair. It took him a while to take on the, the Bridges chair um, because he had to finish his book and get promoted to be full professor. And the book um, is a very interesting book that actually won a prize in labor studies. And uh, so I'm a great supporter of Jim Gregory and I think that his appointment which was made possible by Bridges funds at a crucial point in time has re resulted in great dividends for the Bridges Center and for labor studies and for the labor movement of the Pacific Northwest because once in his position as Bridges chair uh, Gregory has done a variety of things, but not least of them has been this major work to fund uh, a, a labor archive for the state of Washington and come up with the funds to catalog all these papers that continually flow into the Bridges Center from unions, but which we had no resources to catalog and uh, deposit in, into the archives of the university library. So that now we have an arc, thanks to Jim's fundraising uh, efforts and the support of State Labor Council and so on, and, and unions and many private donations, including my own, um, uh, we have a labor archivist. So this has been a really happy story. Great. Um, and, uh, Got two more questions. Um, the first is if you could share anything about the incoming uh, chair, George Lovell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it, you know, as I said at the beginning, these two departments, there was, we didn't know each other very well, and we didn't know who the labor people in the two departments were. But over time, we've served on the steering committee together, and George Lovell has been a member of that steering committee from, I don't know, several, many, many years. So I've gotten to know George just by going to those meetings. And I have great respect for him. He's a very thoughtful guy. He's, um, he really weighs alternatives and comes up with judicious uh, solutions to problems that are not easy to solve. Uh, he's he's a uh, he's a quiet person, but when he gets riled up, he's pretty committed, and um, I think he's going to be a, a very successful chair. Uh, exactly what his vision is, I don't really know. I just know that he's really committed to a better world for working people. Um, well, on that note. What do you see as the future of the, the center? What do you think it will continue to do into the future? Um, and what do you think potential is? Well, you know, as we've gone through these contributions, of course, the center has expanded and expanded, and it's doing so much more than it did in the days when David and I were the first chairs. Um, and your position, for example, Andrew, and your your contribution is something that, you know, without th that position, we, we wouldn't be where we are. I mean, to have someone who can devote full time to running the place and doing the variety of things that you do, I mean, allows the chair to do, to reach out to the community, to 
write op-eds, to give interviews for NPR, to think about conferences, to raise funds, and so on. I hope that the center will continue to uh, uh, develop along a couple of areas that I mentioned earlier that I don't think we've realized are promised yet. And uh, one of them is um, graduate education. That is the future of labor scholarship. I think this, it would be, we could do more to become a center of excellence in training professors and teachers who, who, who study labor uh, and provide resources for the whole nation and the world. And the other thing that I think we need to constantly keep in mind is that, I mean, it's always been true that labor is an international issue. I mean, the labor movement has always been international. Its fate is always tied to international events and trends. And uh, I think we need to do more to, to, to educate American citizens and students about labor in the world. For example, um, I think, you know, labor in China is fundamental to what's going to happen to labor in the world in the next century. And that's just one example. Uh, and so it, it behooves anyone concerned with the labor movement in Seattle or in Washington or in the United States to be uh, knowledgeable and to uh, be, be involved in the struggles of working people around the world. As I said, I work in Latin America and uh, on Colombia, and of course, uh, we need to do a lot to support labor activists and use U.S. policy to uh, at least provide, uh, use U.S. power to influence the situation in which people have to work to organize, to organize flower workers, banana workers, mining workers, petroleum workers in places like Colombia who uh, continue to be victims of the most incredible repression and violence by obscure forces in that country. So those, those two things I think are two big items that we need, we could do more to achieve. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. Um, I think this has been great. We've covered a lot of ground. I think I've got a lot of material for things that we can feature in the video. Good luck, Andrew. I'll look forward to the result.